Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Today, I am going to be talking about what's on everybody's mind at the moment. Who will replace and the process to which led up to the removal, the first in United States history, of Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy. It happened on October the 3rd, which is yesterday as the time I'm recording this video. It happened on October the 3rd in Eastern Time, and currently the Republican Congress is rallying around a number of candidates as to who will replace Kevin McCarthy. So I'm going to structure this video in a very strict and simple manner. First of all, I'm going to talk about why this has happened, why Kevin McCarthy has been ousted. I'm also going to talk about who in particular has been vocally opposed to Kevin McCarthy, perhaps alluding to who may replace him. I'm going to talk about one person in particular, and I'm also going to talk about who are the top candidates to replace him over the next few days and, and what those votes will look like. So let's begin by talking about appropriation and budgeting in Congress. Every so often, Congress has to, vote, has to vote on what's called appropriations bills. Sometimes these are referred to as money bills. What are these basically? Basically, these are bills that don't carry a specific policy other than the most basic of amendments that would allow government employees to be paid and government programs to be funded. If these appropriation bills cannot be passed as a result of disagreements in Congress, the government averts to a shutdown. It has happened in the past. It's happened within the last decade. But in this case, the shutdown was averted. But it was triggered by a man called Matt Gates, who had argued that the funding proposed by Democrats was not feasible. He was a member, and he is a member, of what's called the House Freedom Caucus. This is the most conservative wing of the Republican Party in the House of Representatives. This caucus hosts a few members, but every single one of them has been generally opposed to Kevin McCarthy. That is what put such a thorn in his boot when he was first being nominated. It's why he had to do so many deals with this group as a means to get in. And when he voted to avert a government shutdown with support of the Democrats, those Freedom Caucus members wanted to act against him. As such, Matt Gates, one of the most prominent members of the group, filed a motion to vacate. It, never, it has never happened before that a Speaker of the House has been removed from office, and it is the shortest serving Speaker of the House since 1876. 1876. Have a think about that. That's almost 150 years. So, suffice it to say, this has had a massive impact on American politics. But I'd like to go down and let's have a quick look to see who has voted, who has voted to vacate Kevin McCarthy in the Republican Party. Now, you'll see that all Democrats have voted to vacate him. Now, this is a clear political move, right? Any party would do this as a means to look as though that uh, look as though another party is in factional disarray, and also in, in a means to create speculation around an unprecedented event in American politics and history, that is the removal of Kevin McCarthy. But let's talk. Let's look at the Republicans who voted for it. These are the people that were so committed to getting rid of Kevin McCarthy that they would step out of party lines. Of course, almost all Republicans voted against this and get rid of him. We've got Andy Biggs from Arizona, Ken Buck from Colorado, Tim Burchett from Tennessee, Eli Crane from Arizona, Matt Gates, of course, from Florida, Bob Good from Virginia, Nancy Mace of South Carolina, and Matt Rosendale of Montana. All of these members would be opposed to Kevin McCarthy for the reasons that I've just listed. He's generally unpopular in the Republican field nowadays for his moderate views and his willingness to consort with Democratic House leaders particularly in regards to the appropriations bills and the aversion of government shutdown. There's only one candidate, there's only one individual that I'd really like to talk about, other than Matt Gates, of course, in regards to this list, and that is Nancy Mace of South Carolina. I've spoken about her a little bit in the past, but perhaps not so much. She is a kind of an anomaly here because she is someone I would absolutely classify as a moderate, despite having broadly conservative values, I was surprised to see that she would vote to get rid of him. However, the reasoning that I've seen, at least from her Twitter account, is that she believes that honesty and integrity needs to be brought back to the speakership and she will vote for someone 
who brings that to the table? So now I'd like to talk about prospective candidates. We know why Kevin McCarthy is gone. There's no getting around it. Who will replace him? So I'm on Matt Gates' page here. Do not be misconstrued. I do not believe that Gates is going to be a candidate. I do, however, believe that his career will experience a significant shockwave as a result of this. He's currently member of the House of Representatives for Florida's 1st District. There has actually been a cause from Republicans, because remember, a majority of Republicans would support keeping McCarthy in, at least on a congressional level. There's been a call to expel Matt Gates from the party because he has sabotaged the perception of stability that the Congress has by getting rid of Matt, uh, getting rid of Kevin McCarthy. And for just for to clear it up, it's very unlikely now that the Republican Party will maintain a lead for the 2024 congressional cycle. That is likely gone. But Matt Gates, if he is expelled, he could, of course, further his uh, political career in a different capacity, perhaps as a member of a second Trump administration. He could come on as an independent. He could run with a third party or an independent party, perhaps for the Senate, or again for his former House seat in the next cycle if he is expelled, which it is likely that he will be. But now I'd like to talk about the prospective candidates. I have three people in mind as to who will be nominated and selected for the speakership role. And the first is Tom Emma. So Tom Emma has been serving from the Min So Tom Emma has been serving from Minnesota's sixth district in the House of Representatives since 2015. And he is notably conservative. That is something that the Freedom Caucus is going to appeal to. But not even that. But that's not what's important about Tom Emma. If you look over here, we can see first of all that he was chair of the National Republican Congressional Committee, which is a major office for Republicans. He was that for four years. He was removed just this year. Replaced by, who was he replaced by? Richard Hudson. All right. But not even that. He is the incumbent... House Majority Whip. For those of you who've watched House of Cards, you may know what the House of Major House Majority Whip's job is, to literally whip the votes. It's used as a means to ensure that, that members of Congress stick to the party line or vote in the way that a faction or a committee or a caucus wants you to. That is prudent. That is absolutely crucial to having a stable and structured House. So Tom Emmons' job is very important. He's got to be able to rally up the votes and make sure that policy can get passed. He would have had a lot to do with the Fiscal Responsibility Act. He would have been probably a key player, I think, with policy and legislation that the House, or the Republican House has presented, particularly the Parents' Bill of Rights. So that kind of influence is massive, and he's got a great deal of experience as a result of that. Now, in regards to his political popularity, it's actually not as big a deal in regards to how the populace, population views them, because they don't really have to convince the public, more so as much as they do convince the Congress. So yes, he's fairly old. I believe he's a little bit older than McCarthy, but nonetheless, I don't think it's going to have much of an impact. I think his experience and I think his values are going to be of great value to things like the Freedom Caucus. And I think the Democrats would support him as a result of the political win that it would be to have a more conservative individual at the helm of the House Speakership and thereby inciting moderate Republicans to disenfranchise themselves from the Republican Party in time for the 2024 cycle. And I think it would be a really prudent thing for Democrats to do to nominate him. Just for clarification, Tom Emma is the most likely candidate for the House Speakership. I would be very surprised if over the next few days I don't hear from more Republicans and Democrats rallying around him as a means to have him fill the role. I think he fits all the right marks, but there are two other candidates who I think could also do it. And one of them is Steve Scalise. Why do I think Steve Scalise could be the next Speaker of the House? Well, for starters, he is a conservative. I believe he has a good relationship with the House Freedom Caucus. He, he has significant influence having been in the Congress for 15 years, which is much more, seven years longer than Tom Emma. And he's also had a great deal of experience, of course, through the Congressional Administration. He was chair of the Republican Study Committee. Not that big, but still... That led him on to become House Majority Whip. Do you remember that? 
He was House Majority Whip for five years, served under two speakers, so again, he would have had a lot to do with the legislation passed under Paul Ryan and, of course, Trump. He was the House Minority Whip, so he actually retained the position of House Whip, but it just went to a minority position. And then, in this year, he became House Majority Leader. That is big. That is massive. That's even bigger than House, House Whip, of course. So his experience is out of the question, strong. To build a relationship across the aisle, one that he's already have, I imagine, and that will help him out dearly when it comes to providing stability for Congress over the next few months. Because it's a very unprecedented time, nobody knows what could happen. The problem with Steve Scalise is he's actually probably one of the most conservative individuals in the entire Congress. He has an A-plus rating from the NRA. He has he has a significant record on firearm legislation in regards to supporting it. And of course, he's from Louisiana, which is a very conservative, thick red state. He's going to want to conform to that line. That actually may hinder his prospects at becoming the Speaker. Because remember, the majority of Republicans in Congress voted for largely moderate Kevin McCarthy. So when you put someone in a position who's quite con very conservative into that position, he will have absolutely the support of the Freedom Caucus. The Democrats will likely support him, or at least a majority of them will, as a result of the intentions I raised earlier. But a large number of moderate Republicans will likely oppose him. And for that reason, the fractional, does, the fractional divide between the, United, from, between the Republican Party will get stronger and it will become more divided, and it will just ensue, ins it, the chaos will ensue similar to that which uh, was enabled in January of this year in regards to Kevin McCarthy's nomination. I don't think that Steve Scalise will be the next Speaker of the House, frankly. I think that, I think that his values are in line with one partic particular faction, and while I believe his experience and his administrative capacity outweighs anything else, and it's very strong, I don't believe that he will be able to gain the support of moderate Republicans and Democrats who aren't going to stick to the party line. But the final candidate I'd like to talk about is Jim Jordan. Now, you would have heard about this guy in January of this year. This was the man that the House Freedom Caucus were nominating, despite his technic te technical opposition, we'll say, for the House Speakership role when they didn't like Kevin McCarthy. And the reason for that was because he was once the ranking member and chair of the House Freedom Caucus. Jim Jordan has been in Congress since 2007, representing Ohio's 4th District, and he was chair of the Freedom Caucus for two years between October 2015 to January 2017 to be replaced by Mark Meadows, and he was the first chair. Then he became ranking member of the House Oversight Committee, which is a big, big, big committee in regards to, ju to judicial review in, in congressional events. Then he became ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, and now he is the House and now he is the chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Well, wow, that experience is massive. That says integrity to be chair of the committee that ensures that Congress are doing their jobs with integrity and keeping honest, that is a very confident look for Jim Jordan. He is a staunch conservative, of course. He was the chair of the House Freedom Caucus, and he has been brought up a number of times to replace Kevin McCarthy. And I do think that he has a strong chance, but again, it's a similar problem with Steve Scalise, in the sense that his values are so conservative that his and his experience is largely changed to the executive judiciary branch of congressional oversight. So it's not so much working in Congress with, you, with your affiliates as much as it is over, overviewing it and making sure that it's working up to speed. Now that can get you a really good relationship with a select few of individuals, but not so much as it does with people like the House Majority Whips or the Minority Whips or the the speakers of the house or the leaders of the house and that's not something that you want to avoid when you're going to be running for the speaker of the house now i don't even know if he wants it he hasn't been brought up but i wanted to talk about him because i think that it is a very prudent call for someone like him to be put in the position from a political standpoint and i think that generally speaking it would be an interesting choice 
He's fairly charismatic and he's been shown to be somewhat of a populist, especially during the events that transpired over the beginning of this year. So for that reason, I do think he could be the next candidate, the, the candidate. But I, for the, but I would still conclude that Tom Emma will be the next Speaker of the House. So thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Thank you.